Hi, I'm Bill Rapisi, the Executive Director of Lymphatic Education and Research Network, and I just want to take this opportunity to thank all of you for joining us today for our symposium series. I also want to take this opportunity to thank all of you who have become members of LEARN and help support this series so that we can continue bringing this kind of groundbreaking information uh, to you in your homes and offices. Uh, I would also suggest for all of you who have not become members of LEARN, $5 a month, you can become a member of LEARN and help support this programming and the research that we do. Thanks very much for joining us and I look forward to having you become a member. This is um, where this broadcast is coming from, the Stanford University campus. We're going to talk about lymphedema prevalence and treatment benefits. Uh, again, uh, I apologize for those of you that did get it the first time, but I want to explain the concept of prevalence. Prevalence and incidence are two different terms that are used by uh, people that describe disease within populations. The incidence is the enumeration of new cases of whatever it is you might be talking about. So, um, for example, we can talk about the incidence of influenza uh, attacks during a given year. But when we're talking about lymphedema, in the context we'll talk about today, we're talking about the number of the people in the population who have it. That will include the number of people who are developing it right now, as well as the number of people who have had it over an extended period of time. So we'll be looking at that, and we'll be looking at what the treatment benefits are for this condition. So again, uh, this is the uh, graphic image that I like to use to represent the way lymphedema patients are often greeted in the healthcare environment. Uh, the physicians who feel underprepared to deal with the problem or perhaps don't even acknowledge it simply place their head in the sand uh, like an ostrich. And the net result is for most patients who come to the doctor with a condition that might be or is lymphedema, um, they will meet somebody who maybe recognizes the term but has very little uh, underpinning to make the diagnosis or to recommend appropriate treatments. As a result, um, I like to say that lymphedema is a chronic and debilitating disease. It's frequently misdiagnosed, it's treated too late, or it's not treated at all. Lymphedema is not a rare disease in contradistinction to what many healthcare providers might think. Uh, we know that it can affect the foot, the hand, the arm, and even the head and neck in rarer instances, also the breast, the genitalia. It can occur in any part of the body in which the lymphatic circulation is disrupted or in, is in any fashion not able to work uh, in a normal manner. So in order to um, think about lymphedema, we also have to review what the lymphatic system is supposed to do in health and what is disturbed when disease occurs, namely lymphedema. So number one is, the fluid needs to get out of the extracellular space, the space between the cells, and make its way back to the heart to be recirculated so that there can be fluid balance throughout the body. In certain parts of the body, there are additional roles. Specifically in the gastrointestinal tract, we rely on the lymphatics to help us absorb fat from the diet, including the life-preserving fat-soluble vitamins. And finally, we know that throughout the body, the lymphatic system prepare, uh, participates in the immune response so that the important cells that, that bring information to the immune system uh, have to travel through the lymphatics from the skin or from the gastrointestinal tract or from the lungs in order to allow that immune response to function. And as we'll see, this has a big impact on the likelihood that patients with lymphedema will develop soft tissue infections, uh, otherwise known as cellulitis. So when we think about the lymphatic system, we need to acknowledge that lymphedema is the sign of system failure. Doctors easily recognize that every organ and organ system in the body has a disease aggregation that represents what will happen if that organ or organ system does not function normally? So as a cardiologist, I can say when the heart as a pump ceases to function efficiently, the person will develop congestive heart failure. 
when the pancreas ceases to function as an exocrine gland, the individual will develop diabetes. When the kidney fails, the individual will develop uremia. So skipping down to the bottom of the list, when the lymphatic system fails in a part of the body, lymphedema is the disease state that will occur. And because we already have recognized how important the lymphatic system is in the overall functioning of the body, it stands to reason that lymphedema will occur prominently and commonly to the extent that the lymphatic system becomes impaired. Lymphedema, once it is a diagnosis, is very important to the patients. They um, engender a risk of infection, they have loss of function, they have restriction of movement. We know from very formal studies that people with lymphedema suffer from uh, issues related to psychosocial adjustment. They have a loss of their um, well-organized body image. They thereby lose self-esteem. They develop anxiety and depression. And with all of this, there is a great element of fear. And these are all areas in which we can help individuals to function better if we adequately treat the problem for which they seek medical care. Many of you will already know that the treatment of lymphedema involves a multi-staged and multi-component approach typically administered by a well-trained physiotherapist who will undertake this suite of interventions that in, in, in aggregate is called complete decongestive physiotherapy. And the treatment includes the use of a specific massage technique called manual lymphatic drainage. Often or almost universally, the application of multi-layer bandages that have to be applied um, over repetitive uh, treatment cycles, typically 10 to 20 or even 30 repeated sessions. And finally, uh, with the bandaging material in, in place, the therapist will help the individual to do decongestive exercise. The endpoint, ideally, is that the individual will be fitted with a, a properly sized compression garment the, the job of the garment is not to reduce the size of the limb, but uh, actually to preserve the treatment benefit that has been achieved by the lymphedema therapist. If an individual is diagnosed very, very early in the course of lymphedema, uh, one can sometimes progress directly to the application of a sleeve, but this would be the exception rather than the rule. In addition to the things we've just mentioned, which are all, I would say, necessary components of the treatment, uh, in addition, um, we sometimes, and actually quite frequently, resort to the use of so-called intermittent pneumatic compression devices. They're, these are numerous in design and manufacture, and the choice of a given intermittent pneumatic compression device uh, will be uh, dictated by the actual presentation of the lymphedema and, uh, and the issues that are involved. But as you can see, uh, sorry, we'll go back to that slide, there are both so-called simple devices and advanced devices, and these can be introduced during the phase in which the lymphedema therapist is working or do it during the home care self-maintenance phase that will follow. The issue in all of this is to um, recognize the condition as early as we can to reduce the progression of the disease and reduce the manifestation of the disease, which will require this approach that we've just talked about, and then as we move on to maintain these gains uh, and to avoid complications through uh, the use of the home care elements, which certainly will include the garment and which may include an intermittent pneumatic compression device as well. What we believe is that in lymphedema, the relationships look like this, that um, over time, there is a tendency for lymphedema to progress in terms of severity. And we believe, although it up until recently, it hasn't had much objective support in the way of, of, of um, evidence um, that is obtained in uh, direct clinical trials, but we believe that the earlier we treat the patient on this course of um, 
progression, the more likely we will be to stabilize the condition, reduce the complications, and reduce the likelihood that progression to more irreversible manifestations of disease will occur. So the problem that we sought to address is to look at the prevalence of lymphedema in the general uh, U.S. population, to look at the treatment outcomes in this patient population, and to recognize that the costs of lymphedema are poorly defined. So we wanted to address these questions uh, by looking at a privately insured population of cancer survivors, which was the subset of lymphedema that we looked at in this first study. Um, what we chose to do is a retrospective analysis. We gained access to the health claims data from a very large national insurer. So that means everybody who got insurance benefits through the providers uh, under this broad umbrella were in a large database that we could examine through various access codes in order to look at the subset that we were interested in. So our study purpose was to acknowledge our strongly held conviction that lymphedema is a common and understudied complication of cancer treatment. We uh, attempted to define the prevalence of lymphedema among cancer survivors. We attempted to define the health encounters that contribute to the costs associated with the diagnosis of lymphedema in cancer survivors and to look at the net health economic benefits of specific treatment interventions. So in order to estimate prevalence, we um, used a very simple approach. Again, we had access to this administrative health claims data and the uh, provider is United Health Group uh, and uh, otherwise known as Optum and they have several providers that use their mechanism as an umbrella, uh, but it's a very, very large national health insurer. In order to look at the prevalence rates of lymphedema, we looked at the number of patients identified with lymphedema and concomitantly any cancer diagnosis and divided that into the total number of patients who carried a cancer diagnosis. We were able to look at a six-year sample uh, for, from this database, and then we used the data that we derived from the database and projected it to the overall U.S. population. So in order to do this, we used uh, a set of diagnosis codes. In medicine, we have a, a diagnostic um, uh, overall table of all diagnoses and treatments that's called the ICD-9 code. At the time that this study was done, we were using the ICD-9. Um, just recently, within the last two months, the ICD-10 codes were released. So the numbers would be different than what you see listed here, but the impact would be the same. In other words, there is a coding system for the diagnoses. So we had three distinct um, lymphedema codes that we were able to interrogate. And for cancer, we had a series of appropriate codes that would identify in principle anybody carrying a cancer diagnosis without um, zeroing in on the specific organ or the type of cancer involved. So here are the results from those prevalence estimates. Um, in 2007, we saw that a roughly 9,000 out of 950,000 cancer patients in this database had lymphedema with an overall prevalence of about 1% of this population. By 2013, uh, we saw that the prevalence had uh, increased to about 15,000 out of a larger number of total individuals with cancer. But what it meant is, and I'm sorry because the slide is cut off a little bit from what you're able to see on the screen, that total prevalence uh, increased to about 1.2 percent. So if you look at what actually happened during the period of uh, the analysis, and again, the years are cut off, but the left-hand bar is 2007 and the right-hand bar is 2012. You can see this progressive linear increase in prevalence estimates from about 1.1% to about 1.2% over that six-year period of time. So, based on the U.S. Census estimates, by including privately insured individuals individuals in Medicare managed care, Medicare fee-for-service, 
Medicaid and the uninsured as of 2012, we would estimate that the prevalence estimates for a primary cancer diagnosis is about 10 million, so 10 million individuals uh, out of the entire population with lymphedema, and the annual prevalence estimates for lymphedema were about 121,000. So the point is, not a rare condition, indeed quite a common condition, one that definitely begs us to treat it properly. So what are the health economic impacts of treatment decisions in lymphedema? Well, I, I talked to you earlier about the fact that there is an array of interventions that can be used uh, during the acute treatment of lymphedema, but that these can also include the use of a pneumatic compression device, and that pneumatic compression device can be included either in the acute care or in the chronic care. We chose to look at this specific intervention not because it's uh, delivered to every individual with lymphedema, but because it's a very easily tracked intervention by diagnosis code. And as you can see here, there are basically three uh, uh, billing codes that relate to pneumatic compression devices. They are either a 0651, which is a very simple compression device that you see here, a 0652 that is like the 0651, but it has uh, some adjustability to it, or an advanced device that allows for programmability. So we did not distinguish among these specific uses of pneumatic compression. We simply lumped them together as one treatment approach that we could track within this study. So in order to look at cost comparisons, we identified these patients with both lymphedema and a cancer diagnosis, and we looked at their overall health care costs as well as health care costs in individual subsets for 12 months prior to the time at which one of those devices was prescribed, and then an additional 12 months immediately after the device was prescribed so that we could compare the two um, identical time intervals to see if there was a difference. We divided the costs into lymphedema-related and non-lymphedema-related based on whether the lymphedema diagnosis was linked to the specific claim or not. That doesn't mean they were or were not related in, in actual mechanism, only if they were related in terms of the billing relationships. So we looked, and for total costs, we looked at the total cost of lymphedema and non-lymphedema related um, medical interventions during the two uh, index 12-month periods for each individual. So schematically, this is what the intervention uh, looked like or the study design. So this is the point at which a, an intermittent, intermittent pneumatic compression device was first given to the patient. And then we went backward for a year and forward for a year in order to determine for that individual what were the 12-month costs prior to the pneumatic compression device when the lymphedema was present versus the 12 months following the lymphedema um, uh, administration of a pneumatic compression device. So here are uh, our results. In this first analysis, we had just over a thousand individual cases to analyze. As we know in the general population, lymphedema is very predominantly female in nature, which has a lot to do with the type of cancers that cause the lymphedema. Uh, and we know that in this population, these two other medical conditions are um, remarkably common, both high blood pressure or hypertension, which was present in 60% of these individuals, and obesity as medically defined as a BMI uh, above 27, present in 19% of these patients. At baseline, li these lymphedema patients had very frequent hospitalizations, so we were able to determine that during the index year prior to the pneumatic compression device, 45% of the patients had at least one inpatient uh, stay for medical care. But this is what we discovered, which was really very remarkable. When we look at each of these categories, each of them declined to a very significant 
degree. So we looked at hospitalizations, outpatient use of the hospital, clinic visits for lymphedema, episodes of cellulitis or soft tissue infection, and billing specifically for lymphedema-related physiotherapy. And you can see in each category there was a reduction which was not only measurable but highly significant. So in medical terms we use p-values to determine what is the likelihood that these differences could be seen by, excuse me, what is the likelihood that these differences could be seen by chance alone? And basically, when a p-value is that, which you see for almost all of the categories that are listed, it means that we would see a difference like that on a random basis if we did this study 10,000 times, one of those 10,000 times would come out like this. Basically, that means this is a very highly significant reduction that is not due to chance alone. That is the case for every one of these observations. It also had a huge economic impact. What we found out is that lymphedema afflicted cancer patients have a very high cost of medical care. The baseline annual total costs per patient in the study were over $60,000 and they were related to inpatient care, hospital outpatient care, and office visits. The majority of these baseline costs were in fact non-lymphedema related, meaning for whatever reason, whether it was correct or incorrect, the practitioner did not link the billed uh, administration of care to the diagnosis of lymphedema. Nevertheless, when a pneumatic compression device was administered, there was roughly a twelve to thirteen thousand dollar per patient reduction in the cost of care in the ensuing year. And again, that was very highly significant. This reduction in cost would only occur by chance one time every 10,000 times we did this in study, meaning that in essence it wouldn't occur by chance, it is a direct relationship. So when we look at those economic uh, relationships, again, total costs, number of office visits, number of outpatient hospital stays or, or, or utilizations, number of other outpatient visits all declined to a measurable and significant, highly significant degree based upon the use of the pneumatic compression device. So in summary, we concluded that the prevalence of cancer is high and lymphedema is a relatively prevalent condition and is in an incre seen in an increasing percentage of people with cancer in the United States. The total annual related health economic costs are very high and they occur in all health-related categories. But there is a very marked health economic impact of treatment, in this case, the use of a pneumatic compression device. And it was very favorable in most cat cost categories and was highly significant for the reduction in aggregate total costs. So our conclusion was that this study, for the first time, showed in a population-based estimate of national lymphedema prevalence that in fact this is a prevalent condition among cancer survivors even though there's no reason to really doubt that it's very nice to be able to prove it and the potential public health implications of these findings are very substantial we know that we are dealing in general with an increasingly aging american population which will be predicted to have continued increase in prevalence both of cancer and of cancer related lymphedema and we need to recognize that effective home care therapies are likely to become increasingly important in this general population context. We need to um, accept that lymphedema is common and it's associated with lots of health implications. Therefore, these patients have frequent health encounters that contribute to high annual health economic costs. Treatment decisions such as the use of adjunctive pneumatic compression devices substantially lowers these costs. 
the use of these devices seems to have a particularly favorable impact upon the health economics of this highly prevalent condition of cancer-related lymphedema. I'm now going to progress to my last slide, which is to remind you of that ostrich in the sand that I showed you at the very beginning of this presentation. And what we want to do now is show healthcare providers and Medicare and other third-party payers how ridiculous they actually are in not acknowledging the importance of this diagnosis, the economic importance of this diagnosis, and the fact that we have discrete interventions that we think will not only slow the progression of the disease and the profound impact on patients, but also will serve the, the government and the general population well in that the fact that we believe that this will actually reduce the overall health care costs associated with lymphedema. Phyllis asked why is the prevalence of uh, lymphedema increasing in the cancer population. I think it may reflect that while doctors still vastly under-recognize lymphedema, they probably have gotten a little bit better during the six years um, that we were conducting the initial study or the time frame in which we were looking at that data. I don't know if the actual prevalence or incidence of lymphedema is increasing. We would need to do different kinds of studies to answer that. So Mark Richardson is asking about the potential for the LTB4-based treatments. What is the timetable? Uh, and is it related to the clinical trials we've had underway at Stanford in the past few years? Yes, all of my research is interrelated, and the clinical trials that we've been conducting over the last three years and are about to publish led us down the trail that eventually allowed us to identify the new uh, drug that we will be testing in 2016. So it's very exciting. We have identified a new drug that is very, very effective in the animal model of lymphedema, and it has helped us to identify the underlying mechanisms that drive the lymphedema and cause it to progress and gives us a mechanism to reverse the problem. We are ready to test this in the human disease uh, condition, and we have the uh, sponsorship and partnership of a pharmaceutical company who will uh, help us to um, bring this trial forward. Our current timetable is it will be a Stanford-only based trial, and it will, uh, we will begin enrollment, we anticipate, in roughly March of 2016, so approximately three to four months from now. Uh, Adrian Press asks uh, or says, thank you for mentioning the psychosocial aspects of this condition. Are there plans to study that issue? What about studying the effectiveness of different types of garments? The psychosocial studies should be undertaken. That's typically investigator initiated, so it requires somebody who has a specific expertise in that area. In all of my clinical studies, uh, the clinical trial that we are uh, um, getting ready to publish, we do administer psychosocial instruments um, before and after our treatment interventions, so we will have baseline data, and we will also be able to say something about the impact of our treatments on, uh, on that, hopefully um, with an improvement. Uh, about uh, effectiveness of different types of garments. Yes, I am aware of some direct studies that are underway in the planning stage. In fact, I'm actively involved in the planning and the, un the um, execution of those kinds of studies, which I think will be multi-center in scope, and stay tuned. Hopefully, we'll have more data on that soon as well. So, uh, Bernie, I think it is, um, is asking, is the leukotriene inhibitor based on the animal model expected to cure lymphedema and make garments unnecessary? Well, the answer is, in the animal model, our drug and, our, and, and, and impacting this particular pathway um, does significantly reverse the lymphedema presentation. But like um, any treatment of a chronic condition in in adult medicine, and of course some of this extends to children as well, but I'll, I'll, I'll extend my comments to adult medicine, which is my realm uh, primarily. 
Um, most adult diseases are chronic diseases and are not specifically curable. Infectious diseases are curable. There are diseases like appendicitis that are surgically curable. But most of our uh, treatments in adult medicine serve to uh, reverse and stabilize the manifestations of disease. I don't want to put myself forward as saying that we have a cure for lymphedema, but in the future, it may be that if we can identify individuals who have very early or latent disease, that use of these therapies might cause the disease to not emerge in the first place. I don't have any idea yet in the human disease how much reversal we'll see. Um, we have seen in our trials to date, uh, using other drug therapies, that a certain percentage of patients were able to eliminate garment use, so I would be optimistic about this and more optimistic about this for the new drug that we're going to study, but that's what research is all about, is finding answers like this. Um, Kimmy asks, are you looking to involve participants in the upcoming trials uh, but are not cancer survivors? Yes, most certainly. We are, we are looking to uh, enroll a broad variety of lymphedema causes. Um, the, the chief element in the study is that it's going to be a very intensive investigation for each individual over six months or so, and the individual who participates would need to be able to participate over that period of time, and also to do that, uh, to undertake that participation here directly at Stanford. Um, Lizzie asks, so the medication would also treat primary lymphedema as well? Yes. How do we participate? Uh, well. Uh, the answer is um, there will be primary lymphedema specific investigations undertaken. Uh, stay tuned in the media, certainly on the website of our program here at Stanford to learn about more details. Also clinicaltrials.gov will ha certainly have information about all of these trials. Um, specific contact information, uh, if you're interested in being included, uh, I would say um, if through LEARN you send me an email, I will provide information on how you can contact the appropriate uh, individuals who are pre-screening uh, potential subjects for our trial to be undertaken uh, in the spring. Uh, Mark asks, do you foresee the FLT4 gene mutation being a good candidate for the promising developments around CRISPR technology? You know, I'm not really aware of any immediate impact of the genetic advances that have been made in Milroy's disease or others as they relate to uh, newer technologies. But of course, scientists are generally very interested in this. I think um, genetic causes of lymphedema provide us the greatest insight into the mechanism of the disease and provide avenues for uh, potential um, treatment implications. But, uh, but yes, for sure, we're, we're, uh, you know, we're on the lookout for uh, developments to come. Uh, Mark Richardson says, I would like to roll and roll. I'm delighted. Uh, please contact me uh, offline from this and I will put you in touch with my uh, clinical research crew. Um, and the next question, can you accept people for trial abroad, uh, i.e. my country, Ireland? Know that at the moment the trial will be uh, undertaken specifically at Stanford University and it in involves active and recurrent uh, in-person uh, intervention for measurements and follow-ups and tests and so forth. So yes, anybody who's able to come here and, and, and return at the specified intervals and or stay in the Palo Alto, California area is welcome uh, without regard to nationality, but it is a study that will be performed here. Um, Adrian Press says, given the importance of functioning lymphatics in the GI tract used to absorb fats, is there any connection correlation to high triglyceride levels? Probably indirectly, uh, yes, but lymphedema is more likely, or I'm sorry, lymphatic disease in the intestine is more likely to cause abnormal absorption of lipids leading to uh, increased levels of fat in the stool and a lot of complications associated with that, including a condition called protein losing enteropathy. But what we have learned in recent years is that the lymphatics actually participate in the circulation of HDL, which is sometimes called good cholesterol. And in that context, it may be that lymphatic disease in the blood vessel wall can actually impair overall cholesterol balance and 
predisposed to vascular diseases. That's a burgeoning area. It's very, very important, but it's something beyond lymphedema. Um, Maggie Parada, are there any other clinical trials that you, any other trials that you are aware of in other parts of the country? Not at this time. I'm not aware of any clinical trials on lymphedema. Um, I know there was a, um, a question that scrolled by earlier on that I do want to go back to, uh, and I apologize, I didn't note who, oh, Amy asked, can you address any surgical options for lymphedema patients? At the moment, there are three surgical interventions that I know of um, related to lymphedema. One of them, called suction-assisted lipectomy, is a, an option only for a very small percentage of people with lymphedema who have certain end-stage uh, manifestations, and, um, but that is very, very helpful. It doesn't change the need for garment use. In fact, it mandates long-term garment use, but it can reduce the overall size and weight of the limb and make it much more manageable. The two other treatments are lymphaticovenous anastomosis, or LVA, and the last one is vascularized lymph node transfer. We do perform all of these surgeries here at Stanford, and there are many other centers. I shouldn't say many. A few other centers in the United States that perform one or all of them. We will be doing a trial here in, at Stanford in 2016 also on vascularized lymph node transfer. We believe we have a new discovery that will uh, tremendously increase the success of that surgery, and that one will also be open for enrollment uh, starting next year for people who are interested in a more surgical approach to lymphedema, specifically in that case related to breast cancer-associated lymphedema. As Kathy uh, Bragan, I think it is, asked um, if uh, this can be viewed at a later date because of an interruption. Yes, this will be able to be viewed at a later date. It will be archived. Uh, Carol Curry says, I'm in Maine. Is there any chance any trials will happen here on the East Coast? Yes, I hope there's a chance, but they won't be by me. Uh, if other investigators decide to undertake trials on their own science, and they happen to be on the East Coast, yes, I would hope that those would occur, uh, but I don't have any insight into those. The studies that I am doing are currently single-site studies, but we do envision as we progress and as we get success, some of these will morph into multi-center trials. And, and at that point, uh, if it looks appropriate for you, ideally, and hopefully there will be a site closer to you if you're not able to participate here at Stanford. I think with that, I've gotten to the end of the question queue, and I hope to uh, see you again soon in one context or another. Thanks very much for watching. <laughs>